I was really thinking I was going to have to, I had a, a panel with, like from 11 to 12, so I thought I was going to have to sprint over here. Um, but it's not as exciting as I thought it'd be. I had this vision of a Tom Cruise movie. Hey, you Instead, I was speed walking like those guys on YouTube. You, you ever watch some, like competitive speed walking? Those are athletes. It, that's an Olympic sport, isn't it? Yes. And I think the rule is one foot has to be on the ground. At yeah, all it's time. crazy. I mean, I've tried it. It's very uncomfortable. Is, is it, is it a, like a different set of muscles than regular running? Muscles? I don't know. Let's let's feel my leg. You know. Oh yeah. Oh, is there a new muscle growing? I, I, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. This is basically all we're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, I've decided about to stop writing books and just speed walk. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Happy Friday, San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> Woo! For the one or two of you who might have come in here on accident, this is the spotlight for Pierce Brown. Not the anime erotica. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, no, that's the sequel could be plans. I have announcements <laughs> to make. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to start with my Pierce Brown story. Oh. oh. I think it's back in tw like 2012 before we ever met. I'm at a writing convention with uh, Trisha Narwani and Mike Brath, who are two Del Rey editors. And Trisha comes up to me, and she's like, hey, we have an advanced reading copy of this book. We picked up this book. We, picked, we bought this book from this young guy, and he's really talented, and... We're really excited about this. This book's got legs. So she gave me the book, you know, this Red Rising book by Pierce Brown, whatever. And, and I look him up, and the first thing that comes to my mind is like, damn, this kid's got good hair. <laughs> so, oh, man, you missed my bowl cut days. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I, I looked like Sonic the Hedgehog I, I when I ran. I have an image of you. Like, like, Pierce Brown 2012 in my head, I'm just gonna keep it that way. Uh, uh, it's better, it's better. This is the, this is the depreciating the asset. Depreciating yeah. asset. But um, fast forward 10 years, 2022, and Pierce now is the number one New York Times best-selling author of the Red Rising Saga. Thank you guys. Yeah. He is the author of five books with the new one, Lightbringer, coming out in December. And that is the title, this folks. Year. Yes, sir. So, Pierce, the West. last time I saw you was, I think it was January 2020. Oh, uh, since we know that a book is coming out, oh. uh, my friend Joel Daniel Phillips, who created all these symbols for the Red Rising oh, world, cool. uh, has created this beautiful um, propaganda poster that we're going to hang off the edge here. I was going to wear it in as a cape, but then I got insecure and thought I'd be too douchey, but I should have. Right. Like I'm going to wear it out as a cape, depending on how this goes. All right. There we go. The bottom? Oh, it's red. Oh, okay. So the, uh, the sixth book, uh, not the perfect news, but the sixth book is coming out when, what date was it? I read December. Trisha, so. where are you? May 2023. May 2023. May 2023? Oh my God, May 2nd, 2023. Sorry, that's a mouthful. Um, I appreciate you guys waiting so much. And part of the reason that there is going to be a longer wait is because I realized that this book, uh, I was trying to do too much. So the sixth book will not be the last one. There'll be a seventh book following it. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, it took me a little bit of existential angst to realize this, as I don't know if you guys like, have had an awkward time of it these last couple of years. Um, I did, and it was a it, it, more difficult thing to, to, to write this book than I thought, and I realized I was just trying to cram too much in and had opened up too many cans of worms to just you know, finish it because I wanted to be done. It's not right to do stuff like that. So I wrote the book, and then I threw out half the book, and then I rewrote the book. And then I realized it was two books. So more writing to be done, but more books for y'all. So thank you for your patience so much. I don't take it for granted. Uh, I feel like a kid who has homework that's constantly due. And uh, you might have seen vacation pictures lately, and it's mostly so I can stay sane. So love y'all. Anyway, now we can get to the regularly scheduled program. Yeah, so uh, 2020 January is the last time I saw you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and honestly, that. That evening that we hung out together, we played Risk. It, you know, 
it's that that evening still kind of hurts me. There were friendships that were broken. Do you remember that night? Well, I won. Oh God. <laughs> Wes left. I, I left because I, it was there were four of us, five of us. Five of us. There were five. Then there were four. It, it, it was it was Pierce. It was me. It was Mike Braff, his, his uh, previous editor. There was a lead singer of a rock band there. Yeah, yeah. He he. I think he died first, right? Oh. Okay, yeah, we got eliminated in, first. In risk. Okay, no, he, great. he's alive. He's, he's alive. <laughs> he's very I was much like, alive. Oh, I almost said risk really morbid there. Yeah. And then there was, um, what was her? She, she, she was a, she, yeah, anyways, there's five of us there, and uh, I actually had. my friend Nicole. Nicole, yeah. yes. Yeah, who is the most aggressive and scary out of she all was, of us. She was mean. Yeah. So she'd never played risk before, and she thought the entire point of the game was to hurt people's feelings. Um, <laughs> it, it was a very effective tactic. I, well, I well, only cried well, twice, but. Uh, I left early yeah. because I actually conquered Australia you did. and Asia for like one turn and then all four of them were like you're gonna kick your ass and then they kicked my ass well I mean you overstretched the I, I was common Icarus. era I was of Icarus young that night. I was yeah. Icarus that night yeah but um so, so past two years what's been going on with you man I was <laughs> having been, lots of fun um yeah I mean I've been focusing on um Book six, more than anything else, I've done a few creative things on the side in order to keep my brain sane, um, but mostly trying to figure out the best way to finish out the series and to close out all the character arcs of the people that I've come to love and have been with me for 10 years now. Um, I started writing this when I was 22, now I'm 34, and it's very strange to evolve with characters like that. And you know. At times, it creates a lot of anxiety. I'll be laying in bed, and I'll start doing the math on it, and I'll be like, I should be doing this faster, shouldn't I? And then I realize uh, the books are like now 850 pages and stuff, and I'm thinking that might be part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> but then I wrote another 800 pages, so <laughs> um, you're not going to get a truncated volume, that's for sure. So mostly, it's been pouring myself into that. Um, I've been doing a lot of gardening. Uh, my dog and I have... Um, well, she's trained me very well. Uh, I think she's developed a nervous anxiety disorder. So now uh, we have a war that's going on with the moles in my property. I get that. Yeah. I had that too. Oh, yeah. Welcome to LA. Yeah, we have a kill sheet. Oh. Yeah, she's ahead. Oh. Yeah. H how are you getting your moles? How? I, I tried to trap mine, and they all outsmarted me. Yeah, you can trap them. You can, well, this gets dark real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you can trap them. You can gas them. You can, you can poison them. them. You don't poison them because then your dog could get poisoned, yeah. and that would be, I, yeah. I, I ended up just. You can, uh, well, if you could, you know, if you're a savvy engineer, you could make me a drill. Yeah, it'd be fantastic. Um, we can't do flooding because, you know, L.A. is it built in a desert. We're built in a desert. Yeah. Hard by sprinkler systems. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So it's been interesting. I ended up uh, just getting fake grass. Fake grass? Fake. The problem with fake grass for me is that when the dog urinates on it, that ammonia smell is always in there. That is true. Right? Yeah. And so when I go to those houses, I'm like, Ooh, I can't oh, lay down okay. here. Yeah. I mean, Who wants to have a picnic next to ammonia, you know? I mean, it's better than moles. I literally couldn't tell them. Anyways. We're, Sorry. We're, yeah, so. Uh, People, <laughs> those of you in the audience who have had issues and dealings with moles can sympathize. The rest of you look at me like I'm insane. But if you ever, like years from now, when you encounter moles who devastate your lovely property, you will understand, you'll think back in this moment, and you'll think I wasn't extreme enough. Oh, I mean, I'm from Chicago originally, and back in Chicago, like living in a condo or whatever, you know, the only thing I ever cared about was like a leaky roof. Mm -hmm. A leaky roof was like ruined my day. But I moved to LA, and suddenly like everything wants to kill me. There's like earthquakes and fires and rattlesnakes. Oh and man, that was me when I moved to Arizona. Yeah. Or scorpions. Scorpion. Or yeah, there were scorpions in your shoes. Uh, like I was, I was from Iowa. I didn't know that could happen. Are you from Iowa? Well, I'm, I lived in eight states. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we moved around a bunch. All right. Yeah, but scorpions. There's um, palm thorns. Anyone from Arizona here? Yeah. Well, anyway, you step on these things and your foot swells up to the size of a cantaloupe. It's right. crazy. I didn't know what cantaloupes even were then, but I found out because we compared them. Did you, did, it, did, one, did you step on one? I stepped on a palm thorn, not a cantaloupe. Okay. <laughs> I have since stepped on cantaloupe, but thanks for asking. All right. So, you started, so you're saying you started writing Red Rising 12 years ago, right? Gosh, yeah, I was, I was 22. It didn't get published until 2014, but um, it was, yeah, 12 years ago now, which is very strange. I feel as though we've taken this, you know, giant decade leap forward in the last two years for some reason. There's the before and after. And I think it's because of you know, the inability to populate uh, the intervening years with memories, you know, the same kind of, and so time 
seems to jump. But yeah, it was uh, that long ago. So Daryl at Pierce Brown 22, how has he evolved in a way over the past 12 years that you weren't expecting now that you're, you know, five books in? Well, this is, this is part of the reason for, or one of the big reasons for the delay in the books is uh, the initial uh, book six Darrow that I was writing was far more a product of, uh, I guess, my 20s. He was a product of the, the things you guys have known to come to, to hate and love about him, which is you know his anger, his brooding, um, all these kind of darker tendencies. And I was starting to, I, and I wrote most of the book that way, and then I realized that was the wrong tack to take, particularly at where I was in my life. And so there's been this wonderful, but also difficult parallel between his path and mine, I suppose, in coming to an understanding about the world he exists in. And I think when he was younger, he was just angry. You know, angry about the resistance of a system, angry about the domestication that he'd had when he was younger, um, aggrieved at something larger than himself and having a complete lack of agency. And I think, honestly, writing these books is what gave me agency in life. And it was reading books that allowed me to have agency when I was younger. And so I found that because well, we moved around a lot. I moved to eight states, you know, following my parents around. And I didn't, I wasn't able to take my friends with me, so I took my books with me. And I existed, most of my, I'd say 90% of my brain activity existed in the Star Wars universe and in the Dune universes. And I've read every single one of the, you know, expanded universe and Star Wars books uh, from Splinter of a Mind's Eye all the way up through the Yuzhan Bong series. And that's like a hundred and something books. And it's, that was my constant, more so than more so than the world around me. And in many ways, Darrow has been my constant, you know, more than the world around me. But I think that um, in my 20s, everything seemed so, so important. And so, uh, how would I say, like close, like the art seemed so important. And then I think during COVID, uh, it didn't seem very important. And I had to make it feel important to me again. And I realized it didn't feel important because Darrow's journey didn't feel authentic. He, was, he hadn't changed enough. The whole point of novels this is to show a character change over time, change over story, uh, confront obstacles, go around them, go over them, or Darrow's case, go through them. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You're already doing that. Yep. Uh, go through them. And I realized that in many ways, I wasn't being honest enough with Darrow and honest enough with the, the, the series. Um, because while there are other POVs in these, in these books, I think the temptation is to keep you know, spreading it out and blossoming it out um, and then forget that Darrow is really the spine of it and the point of it um, and the people around him. And so I've really brought it back to that instead of continuing to expand out with more characters. Because a lot of the series that I love and appreciate and look up to did that. They kept expanding through characters and trying to make you care about characters who came along later on in the series when really you care in your heart about the, the original DNA, the original people. And so book six is my return to that. Um, instead of continuing to go outward, it's uh, blossom outward and go back in in a pointed way. I don't know what the question was. I'm rambling, and I like to ramble. <laughs> well, I, mean, I have you hostage here for like the next 40 minutes. It's great. I, I mean, and definitely, like in, in your earlier books, you know, we, we saw a lot of anger, a lot of like a sense for revenge and justice in, in Red Rising and, mm. and, the, and the sequels. And then for Iron Gold, definitely, we, we see a more like war-weary kind of Daryl. And in many ways, even though he's infinitely more competent than he was in the first few books, he's mm -hmm. also a lot more doubtful mm -hmm. because he's just... Once you know more, you question more. I, you're a writer, you know that. Yeah, yeah it was way easier to write your first books, isn't right. it? And you weren't as good a writer then. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 right. the, and the more you know, the more you doubt like, what you're doing because you can see the problems. And you can see the problems, but more so I feel that it's, it's hard to be honest because you're coming at it from here, not right. here. And those first books are here. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's desperation. You're desperate to... Um, tell your story, you're desperate to express yourself, so it becomes cathartic to write. But once you've expressed yourself, then you become almost more defensive. You hole up in your castle. You build more, higher walls. You put, uh, and I think this is true in, every li in any life. As soon as you have something to lose, you become more conservative. You become afraid of making a mistake that'll fuck it all up, as opposed to going out there and doing the thing that made you able to have the castle, so to speak. And 
I think that that was a flaw that I was seeing in my own life and a flaw that I was seeing in Darrow and uh, a flaw that I was seeing in my writing. And so I've really tried to go back out there and you know, take the terror to the countryside, so to speak, instead of just sitting in the castle and growing you know, ancient and torpor. Like, did, did you pants your first books or did, or did you outline everything? I pants my first three books. First, all three books you pants? Yeah. And then did you outline the last three or the last two? I did, yeah. And I find that I don't like outlining. <laughs> <laughs> I try so hard to outline, but then I feel like you lose the passion because you've already arrived at the epiphany. Um, I do think I need some vague outline. You know, maybe if I think for my next book, I'll just do a paragraph. But I did a you know 25-page outline for book six, and I found that I was very bored when I was writing it because I knew where it would go. I knew the beats, and I was spending too much time on the chapters trying to earn it as opposed to getting to the exciting things. And that really, when you think about it, comes from what I talked about earlier, fear of losing what you've gotten, losing a story that I enjoy telling and that you hopefully enjoy reading. And when you are operating from that place, all that really is is insecurity. And when you write when you're insecure, it doesn't work as well because you're just trying to prove that uh, this is a justified decision, this is a justified action, as opposed to getting to the fun stuff and then explaining it afterwards. Right. I mean, I used to, I, I pants my very first book, and then ever since then I've been outlining. And what I've learned, just, just like you said, is sometimes when you create an outline, you kind of put your characters in a box where you want them to make a right turn and they really got to make a right turn, but they don't want to make a right turn. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I, I find that when I outline, it's this happens, then this happens, then this happens. But when I write kind of a without, with a vague idea, I say this happens, but then this happens. This happens, but then this happens, but then this happens. And that's way more fun for me to get up every morning and being like, hmm, I wonder what mischief will right. cause. Like, like As opposed to, hmm, I'm going to fill in this section of my outline, you know, in right. thicker form. I mean, what I've been doing more recently is I would outline like whatever per act instead of a per book. Because yeah. usually when you, when you jump the rails early on, you're like, crap, I just threw away 15,000 words of outline. So I outline like per act. And usually when a character makes a decision that I don't want him to make, I let him make it. Uh -huh. And then I just re-outline. So by the time I finish my book, I'm like at outline 9.6 or something like that. Yeah. And there's like 50,000 words of and outline hating words. hating yourself for not having a better organization I, system. I know, but yeah. the characters made more honest decisions. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's the big difficulty is when you're driving everything to a character making it, needing to make a decision and you get to that point and you're like, is this emotionally honest for the character? And a lot of times you'll find out no and you'll waste a month even trying to figure out how to justify that decision before you really realize the character wouldn't do that. And then you have to unravel it, but that's a lot like playing Jenga. You know, how many pieces can you pull out and change before the structure falls? Or just have you just kind of phrase apart. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, so, how's been writing been during the pandemic? I mean, how, how has your process been treating you? Um, a bit like Groundhog Day, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm lucky enough to have all the time in the world to write, but I, and I thought that that would, I thought when the pandemic began, you know, I'd, I'd enter into like, a, I don't know, like a, a Stephen King book and all of us, like I'd be one of his, you know, author characters who just, you know, is hunched at the typewriter for eight hours a day with the system, you know. Um, and pound something out and then something magical would happen. But what I found was that I'm far more extroverted than I thought I was. Um, I never had you pegged for an extrovert. Or in, extrovert or introvert? Extroverted. I know, everyone thinks I'm an extrovert, but I'm not. It's all fake. <laughs> it's all no, it, I spend energy on people usually. I get that. I love, I love yeah. interacting, but I spend energy, but I acquire it by myself. But then I found that I was having difficulty acquiring energy because it was the same experience all the time. I'm lucky enough that none of my close family was hurt or, you know, lost their lives or injured during the... Uh, epidemic, but I did have friends who had that. And so I felt almost like this voyeur to this thing that was happening in the world without really being connected to the world. Right. So I found it, you know, very difficult to write creatively and to be Absolutely. inspired. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what I have you, man. I mean, all my friends were like, yeah, you know, your life is exact same. You never left the house anyway. So what's, mm -hmm. What's, what's, what's the big deal well, for you? It was cool when everyone else had to leave the house, but when I know, everyone's oh home, gosh, I, I'm just like a they, sheep again. I, I, I don't like people being in my house. When yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm like, go back to work. But, you know, it's, it's, I'm kidding, and but, technically, even though you know, the, the way I think about it is, um, yes, nothing physically has changed, but mm -hmm. mentally, like all my headspace is just like overwhelmed by mm -hmm. like 10 a.m. Yeah, I think it's too, much, it's too much time to scrutinize what you're doing. Yeah. You know, it's too much time to scrutinize your patterns, 
your behaviors, your writing, and you indict yourself for it. And so instead of growing, you just stay in this place of constant self-examination. Or you're just rolling in circles. That's yeah. what I did. It's oh, a, yeah. I mean, I must have thrown away like 130,000 words. Did you, did you manage to finish a book this year? Or the last three years? Oh, um, I haven't. I mean, I, I had... I tried so hard. <laughs> I, I also had two kids since then. You know, since the last I week. didn't. But um, I don't think... You know what? It's, I, 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 sold, I sold the book... To, off of um, off a of partial, and I finished it in 2020 with the, both kids in the house, and my, both of my kids are under six years old, so it's kind of like you know. Eh. And then after that, it just broke me. Like book two just broke me, and I I spent o- a year rewriting like 60,000 words over and over oh, again. Oh man, yeah, we just massaging it in yeah. a different. And then by the end, you're like, what is this Byzantine monstrosity? And then you throw it away. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I, I I actually printed out because uh, I I don't know why like. I bought this one of those big like printers that you see like those those oh, big enterprise when you get out printers? of when yeah when you get out of college it, like yeah I got a when you get out of college and you um you know you think you're going to be running the world and then you end up getting coffee and making copies of things it was one of those printers because it was like on sale and so I printed <laughs> out the book and then I uh, the thing I did right and then I burnt it oh. and uh, yeah I mean do you get rid of all the digital copies as well. No, I'm not crazy. <laughs> so it's very symbolic. You yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it was just, you know, it was, it was a little drama for, for little Pierce. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, did you adapt your way of, of, of working to get through this, or are you just kind of like, what, what was your solution to getting past the pandemic? Well, right? okay. Um, how many of you guys are writers in here? All right, so how many of y'all use Microsoft Word? Okay, who are the psychopaths that use Scrivener? Psychopaths. Um, I tried using Scrivener because it, on the, uh, on the, uh, it really does make sense logically because you can, for those of you who are not uh, initiated, um, Scrivener has a wonderful uh, template where you can see all your chapters at once and you can see different parts of your book and it's wonderful for organization. Uh, I found that it was too much information, and so I was constantly dancing around, tap dancing, so to speak, between chapters, fixing things, writing things out of order, and I was never able then to find the flow of the book. And so I found really that when I was when I was trying my uh, for like a year and a half or two years, I was writing on Scrivener, and it messed me up more than I can say, um, because I write linearly. I write down the page. I show up, and I, all I have, all I know is don't reread. Write down the page. Yet with Scrivener, the temptation was too great. Click. Oh, I'm back at the beginning. Oh, that's not a good word phrasing. Oop, sink in. And then all of a sudden, you're, edi- you're an editor. You're not a writer. And so Scrivener turned me into an editor. And so after that colossal fuck up, <laughs> Stella got her groove back. Went back to Microsoft Word. I function best in ignorance. Um, I fi- you know, the first draft is the first draft. It should be ignorant. It should be silly. You should not know everything. You should not be able to dance back and forth and go through. You're just supposed to get it done because how can you diagnose what's wrong with the patient until you have a patient? Yeah. You know? I, mean, I mean, I find that once I put my editor hat on, I'm, I'm just wallowing then in like editor world. Oh, my God. And, and it's harder, Edi- it's harder and to not, create because yeah. it's, it's a whole different part of my brain. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, tr- my editor's here and she's just shaking her head probably because, you know, and she kept like, whenever we talk on the phone, she's like, you know, I'm here whatever you need me. Six months go by. How are you doing, Pierce? I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> you know, and, and it, it, it's, it's funny because you become a perfectionist and no one's read your stuff. You know, I used to have like this whole, I think what was weird about this book is that I used to have like a, you know, a, a phalanx of friends that read my stuff that I was excited to share with. And then in this new one, I didn't share the book with any of these people because I wrote it in such a strange way with Scrivener that none of it made linear sense. It was all bop, 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 bop. And then there'd be like, you know, um, a whole section that would be like, this happens and this happens, but it wouldn't be written out, so there would be no emotional evolution of the characters. So I'd get down to scenes that I'm writing near the end of the book without having written the stuff that would change their emotional en- you know, engagement with that moment, and I didn't know what they were saying to each other because I don't know where their emotions are. And so Scrivener was a learning lesson. I love Scrivener. Ah, I don't know what's wrong with you. Mainline that into my... <laughs> Into me. Um, so, it's organized. I give it that. Well, you know, it, it, it does require like a sense of like focus and that kind of like tunnel vision on what you're doing. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't can get overwhelmed. Oh, yeah, but I'm a dog chasing cars, oh. man. Like, or shiny things. Like, you're like, new, new scene, and you go into it, and yeah. it's six hours later, and you're like, oh. 100%. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. Then I'll put on the right music, and I'll be like, you know what this music reminds me of? And then I'll go back to a space battle that was at the beginning of the book. 
Um, <laughs> And, and, and then, I'll, then I'll get my jazz on and I'll be like, oh my God, it's now 3 a.m. I thought I was writing Mustang's death sequence today. No. Oh, whoa. We got to cut the recording here. JK. <laughs> so, uh, did you get a pandemic hobby? Uh, did, I get a pan did I get a pandemic hobby? I bought an ocarina, man. <laughs> the water? <laughs> wait, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> the musical instrument from uh, Zelda. I got that and started playing that shit. Oh, you mean that little pipe? Yeah, the little pipe. It is so complicated. There's like 13 holes. <sighs> so I did that. I just timed it all wrong just now. <laughs> I gardened. Oh my God, you guys should have seen my garden. It was amazing. And then I come out there like, mm, I'm gonna eat all my tomatoes. I'm gonna have all my friends over. We're gonna eat my tomatoes. We're gonna eat my squash. You know, these aren't metaphors. We're gonna eat the f vegetables. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and not only do I have a grievance with the moles, the coyotes attacked. My entire garden was destroyed, and I was like watering that thing like every day for three for three months, and then uh, the garden got destroyed. So that was a hobby. Did you go to war? Did you go to war with them? You you legally can't. That is true. Yeah. And morally, too, you can't. Um, but, uh, yeah, the coyotes and I, have, we have a grievance. There, there, there's a lot of coyotes. I have a 20-pound dog, and like, if I was a coyote, she would look like filet mignon yeah. running with a tail. You know, so I understand. <laughs> uh, so I, I was gardening. I was playing my ocarina. Um, <laughs> seriously. Uh, <laughs> I even had like this hat. Never mind. <laughs> Can, can, can I was like trying to establish healthy rituals, and so I had a hat that my friend, uh, who's Pakistani, got me the traditional Pakistani cap, and so it was my private time in the mornings, and I would journal and write so, and play my ocarina. So in, the, in the morning, you would wear the hat, you would journal. Yeah, you yeah. Chop some gophers. Yeah, and it all got ruined when someone saw me in the hat and died laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this really beautiful image in my head. You know, um, I imagine you know uh, Ghost when uh, Patrick Swayze is um, you know. Making pot. Molding that, that pot. And Demi Moore comes crying, it's so funny. Um, Demi, Moore, <laughs> Demi Moore comes out and wraps her arms around him, you know. I imagine someone would do that with me and my ocarina. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I got laughter instead, well, just disabused me of that idea. <laughs> Sorry, it was a really like personally hilarious moment. <laughs> oh. Oh. We have big dreams. Sometimes they, they die to laughter. Uh, you, what was the question? I don't remember anymore. Hobbies? Yeah, ho hobbies. Self-ridicule. Did you always want to be a writer when you were young? Or no, this, I, didn't know like it, I didn't know it was possible. Yeah. No, I didn't know it was possible until I was probably 18. Is, uh, is that when you started writing Red Rising? Uh, no, I wrote six books that um, uh, did not work. And then I wrote Red Rising. It was, my, la it was my last cry into the void. You, you wrote six books since... When you were between 18, 18 to and 22? 22? Yeah. My goodness. Well, I, I didn't say they were good books. I, Books um, are books, man. Yeah, no, yeah. I, actually, look, my look, first. Look, my once first, you hit finish, oh yeah, that's well, a my, book. my first book uh, was called Requiem for Light. Very serious title, uh, and it was like this 700-page uh, monster fantasy book about uh, knights who ride Pegasuses and Griffins and all that sort of things. But they're wildly corrupt, and um, there's some interesting things. Well, the crazy thing about it is, I was rereading it, and there's pit vipers in it. And the main character is very similar to Darrow. It's very strange the things that, from your early writing, you end up then well, taking I mean, and refining. I mean, how much of Darrow is you, though? I mean, really, well, my first main character is, is, is very me, and that's probably because I was, I was younger. And I, I, you know. Well, Darrow might be like the idealized me. Truthfully, I'm more Severo. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Except for I, I have way better personal grooming standards. Um, <laughs> But that's because, you know, y'all bought my book and I could afford clippers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, so there, there were books at the beginning, but I think it wasn't, you know, it was, I had not found my voice yet. Um, and then I wrote down the line, uh, there is a flower that grows on Mars. Um, you know, it, what is it? it uh, it's called Hamanthus. It means blood blossom. And I just knew I had the tone. And so I, I just ripped from there. But, uh, you know, it was, um, I was just kind of impassioned, you know. It was easier to write when you're younger because you don't know anything. And you just get, you have so much energy. I'd sit there for 10 hours at a time, you know. Just the only thing that would make me get up is my laptop dying. Um, 
and it would get too hot when it was plugged in, and I was worried about my reproductive organs. So, <laughs> and then I would put a pillow there, but then I'd be riding like a T-Rex. Um, but I had this circular couch that was perfect, and uh, yeah, I wrote six books in that circular couch. Are, yeah. you, are any of those six ever going to come out? The what? The other ones? Any of the yeah? Any of your pre Red Rising books? Well, it depends. You know, it's like, do you do I want you guys to think? Is you guys thinking less of me <laughs> worth money? You know, <laughs> so probably not. <laughs> um, there's some fun things in there. There certainly are. I had uh, one which is like my version of a kind of a Chronicles of Narnia meets Bioshock. Okay. Which is fun. I'm intrigued. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's uh, two kids are coming home from um, on the eve of World War II being evacuated from England before the Blitz and their ship sinks and they wake up on a stone hand in the middle of the ocean and then they go down into the hand. So that's kind of... Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I found that... Um, We'll see. I have new ideas that I'm eager to explore. All right. Yeah. I mean, are, uh, are there any genres that you kind of want to explore outside of what we do? That is not a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's move it forward. There we are. Um, yeah, fantasy. I mean, I think you guys know that Red Rising is sci-fi fantasy, you know, or science fantasy, so to speak. Um, I don't think that genre, you know, is a, a ironclad system you know you can i think all my stuff will be mashup yeah. but i want to do kind of a history fantasy next you know it's kind of like playing Elden ring you know you kind of like i haven't played oh. Elden ring i'm not allowed to until i finish the book that's probably that's probably a good idea but it's kind of like the whole like mixed class thing where it's like it's not quite you're not quite a warrior you're uh, not quite a magic yeah user. no i love that i love yeah. that yeah i was i was like being like the rogue yeah but we have some magic throw a little like look a little, yeah, little what do you what, what's your character i'm always a wizard you're always a wizard. Yeah, because like, like I did a lot of martial arts, so I'm like, I, I quote unquote fought in real life, and so like I, I can't cast spells, oh, I, in, I can't cast spells in like in real life, so I want to be a wizard when I play a game. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it's 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 very it's very like FOMO driven, I think. Yeah, sure. Um, it's always interesting seeing what I kind of judge play? my friends who like get the really like, you know, good looking avatar, <laughs> and I'm just like. I mean, you could be anything, and you choose to just be good-looking. How conventional. Do, 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 you make, do you make your characters look like you, or do you make them like... No, I make them, well, I make them look like the inner me. Oh. What does yeah. the inner you look like? Freaky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always like, you know, the, I don't know, the, the drow or the, uh, you know, reptile or whatever. I am always yeah. making, like, Asian elf. Asian elf? I can't help it. No matter what I do, it ends up looking like Asian elf. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they have Asian elves. I think they have elves. Well, I try. You know, I'm always like, just, Asian just if you, oh, oh, you, oh, you mix the. I, I oh, literally, okay. I'm like, how do I make him look like me, but elf? Oh, I see. And, I see. I thought that they didn't define. Our, I mean, our classifications in modern, world, you know, in our time, in our world, didn't transform. I mean, transport. for descriptive purposes, this is that's kind of what I mean. I understand. For. That makes sense. Yeah. But you're always a rogue. Uh, no, I'm not always a rogue, but I always get irritated when I'm not a rogue because then I see someone playing a rogue and it's way cooler and more fun. Uh, do you play a lot of those like those sneaking games, or, like those PC uh, video games? Oh, I don't play many games anymore. Oh, sadly. What, do you, what, what do you play? Anything? Torture myself by writing. That's what I do. Oh, you're not playing. I games? don't play any games, man. No, um, except <laughs> except <laughs> I was waiting for that. I love the Total War series so oh, much. God. I started playing Shogun when I was a kid. Has anyone played Total War here? Yeah. Okay. So you guys know, like the 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 AI has not really advanced much. But the novelty is still there when you, and it's like, you know, you got Rome 2, which I go back to a lot. I got, loved the, the Troy version. I thought it was great. Three but Kingdoms is like one of my favorite Three games. Three Kingdoms is a, is a fantastic one. Yeah. Fantastic entry. Great. I mean, it's actually, it's based off of enough like real life legend and lore and history that like I'm like, learning stuff about, you know, totally. about like you know, so ancient I'll China. Yeah. And I'll dive into those. My problem is I have no ability to self monitor uh, and I will play until f six in the morning. And then I will take drink a lot of coffee and keep playing um, until I can't, and then I kind of crash, and then I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I'm a writer. I should go back to that." So back like, I'll play video games once every three months, but I'll play for like two days straight, uh -oh, and then I'll be like, "I can't do this." System, and then you go back to yeah. work. Yeah, well, it's good because the AI hasn't changed, as we all know who played Rome Total War, which is basically empire building stuff, and you get to control huge legions of men and uh, empires. But uh, when the AI cheats and just you know kind of spams you, it just gets less fun. Yeah. But yeah. I think we only have 15 minutes oh, left, yeah. so maybe we should kick it over to the uh, audience. So open up for questions. Are there any questions? Yeah. You, sir? Yeah, I have a question. Just um, in terms of the character of Daryl, when you were writing the character, did you base that on the any historical figure? Like, or have you, since you wrote the character of Daryl, thought of a historical character that you could fit him into, like Marcus Aurelius? 
Sure, sure. Well, it's interesting. Some of his, um, some of his ta on a tactical level, he's very much like uh, General Patton. Um, I wouldn't say as a character, though. I'd say sometimes in his use in the battlefield. Um, I think of him sometimes as a, uh, as a, like a reluctant Julius Caesar type. Um, not in terms of Julius Caesar, like, you know, as we know him in Shakespeare, but kind of like what he was really like. And if you've read Gallic campaigns, you just see how analytical he is. And he, he you know, if he, if he gets, if he's besieging a city and he's, uh, of, of hundreds of thousands of people and then an army comes up from behind him he doesn't quit the siege he builds another wall behind him and then he's like you know he's besieged and then he still wins um so i think he's he's one of them but i also like um uh, i also like uh, alexander's general seleucus um who's also a pretty good inspiration for him and spartacus of course just archetypally just because he's cool you sir <laughs> well, I said long ago, if any of my characters were to kill me, I would go uh, with my head crushed between Victor's thighs. <laughs> and that's, and, and the best thing about writing her is I know she would, like, like why she's so fun to write is because I know she'd do it with a smile on her face. Um, she's got style, she's got grace, I love that girl. Um, yeah, she's the most fun because I think Severo can sometimes be a cipher for me of like how much comedy, do you, how, how deep comedy do you take him, how much comic relief is he, and then how true do you stay to his initial character as a dark outsider, because that's what he is. He's funny, but you can take him into a ludicrous direction which would then demean the character. Whereas Victra, you know, it's so fun to just write an obnoxious patrician who's also like got your back. You know, she's Cassius without his, all of his emotional trauma. You know, initial Cassius is really fun too. He was great because he was just so fucking arrogant. Um, and you know, I've always, I've always loved the, that, that arrogant imperialist who's like, oh my God, like Michael Caine from, uh, what was it? Uh, Africa movie. Anyway, yeah. Um, you in the far back? The reason you ask that question means yes, because you see all the possibilities of keeping him in the story and all the possibilities of that fight. And I saw them too, and I wanted to do them. And then I realized that wasn't something, that's something I'd done before to a degree. And the reason it hurts and stings and sticks with you, and the same thing with you know F, is that you see the path ahead of them, the, the way they were changing, what they were growing into. and. That's how I knew the decision was correct. Um, did I want to do it? No, and that's why I had to do it. Um, plus, man, if there's any character that would do that, it would be Lysander, you know? Okay, you on the left. Uh, is there any inkling of an update you could provide on some sort of visual media TV show? Or yeah, that's All a real right. question. Oh boy, I wish we were on my time schedule on this one. Uh, that's another reason that, you know, the, the this, book has been taking a little while as I've been splitting my time doing work on that. So yeah, it, I mean, it's been optioned and then re-optioned again recently um, by a big streamer. Um, but we're still in the development process. Uh, the fortunate thing is they want to put enough money behind it that they know they can't fuck up. You know, which is good and bad. Um, yeah, it's good and bad. And the whole point of it is, is it, it it's not a project that's just gathering dust. There's constantly a team working on it, but unfortunately Hollywood moves at its speed. Very slow. And its speed, oh my God. Yeah, the frustration. Um, the good thing is the people who are working on it, I think all have the same vision that I do, which is to make this thing a close literal adaption of the books, not something that you know, changes something for convenience. I mean, the first meeting I had in Hollywood pitching Red Rising was after Mars Needs Moms and uh, John Carter had come out. And the producer, a big producer, with not even a joke on it, you know, not even a joke in his eyes, asked, can we move it to Venus? Um, and I think that there's, initially, Red Rising always struggled with people who wanted to change fundamental aspects. When, I was at, when it was at Universal and being adapted, I was agog at how much they just wanted to change willy-nilly without any thought of how it affected the later books. And that's because I realized they hadn't read the later books. 
um, as so often is the case. Now I think it's at the right home, uh, just hopefully we can convince uh, our hosts to let us make it. Um, so no, no time frame on it, unfortunately, still developing it, but I'll keep you guys in the loop as soon as the, you know, the gag is lifted. As of now, it is live action, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Let's just say I like keeping my options open. <laughs> yeah, for me it's a feeling thing. It's not a grand scheme thing. If I feel I have a story to tell there, yeah. But if not, I won't stretch it past you know, what's right. Um, and that's all based on my gut at the time. So hard to say, but I would like to keep my options open in that regard. But I think there's also a possibility in the Red Rising future to go to prequels. Um, you know, the, con the conquering, right? Yeah. There's, I think there's a lot of interesting material to work with there, and it's unlike a lot of other prequels, you don't know what's gonna happen exactly, or how it's gonna happen, and there's a lot of mystery of what actually happened between Akari and Selenius. Um, there's a lot of mystery behind uh, John Merriwater, um, who's, yeah, he's my favorite, he's my favorite kid. Hey, what's up, man? Telemannus over there. Um, we got, uh, I think that there's a lot of, how would I say it? There's a lot of things that I could do in the Red Rising world um, that may have to do with char the characters we know and love, but I also think one of the flaws of the Star Wars, re you know, the new, the new ones is continue is basically they're continuing this like idea of aristocracy of these noble bloodlines, which I think is kind of against the Star Wars, uh, you know, spirit. You know, uh, I don't believe in royalty, and so focusing on packs, if I did that, I'd really have to be conscious of not making this a royal bloodline, because that's not what Red Rising is. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you spoke a little bit about how you have difficulty outlining book six. Can you talk about how that will affect your process going into book seven? I think, yeah, very well asked. I think that um, I was putting down facts, I was putting down locations, instead of putting down uh, feelings. Um, I think the next one I will, inst I will still do an outline, but instead it'll be paragraphs. It'll be paragraphs instead of bullet points. Bullet points don't make sense to me. Paragraphs make sense to me because then I can sink into the context of how I thought about the idea and how we got there and what informs my character's decisions. Plus then it's a vague idea, which is how I function best. As long as I know my trajectory, I'm good. Um, so I think it'll be you know, a shorter outline, uh, maybe three or four pages, and it'll be paragraphs. And I think that would relieve a lot of the burdensome things in my head because sometimes I feel very reticent to let go of certain bullet points and I think I have to hit them all. And then I realize no one cares, no one will see those bullet points. All you guys care about is the story, how we feel, how we got there, what it means. And if I embrace that as a writer, you know, as a re almost as if I'm reading it myself, then I'm engaged, if that makes sense. I need to find a out way to make an outline that engages me. Of course. You ma'am? Yep. Yeah, I'd say that um, recently it's uh, Harari's books, um, Sapiens, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, um, but then Homo Deus I found to be his best book. Uh, Sapiens is about how humanity evolved. Uh, Homo Deus is about how culture evolves and what it, the common myths that bind and make culture. And I found that to be really instrumental in my writing because I like, I like economics and political science. And then his book, Lessons on the 21st Century, which is, you know, his guess at where we're going. So those have been really influential in the nonfiction world. Uh, in the fiction world, you know, I think, I think for me, it's, I, I go back to, I go back to the, the, the myths. You know, if, if you have just a general idea of Narcissus and you want to write, I don't think that's enough. I think you need to know what Narcissus meant to the Greeks. You know, um, for instance, I, but I, I, I would also say that my favorite in the last three years has been reading uh, Plutarch's Lives, um, where he does comparison lives between uh, Romans and Greeks of the day. So he finds people where he thinks they have commonalities and does almost like a New Yorker style article on them. And 
it's hilarious, he's funny, it, it contextualizes history in a way. I think that we should all have been taught history. I think every history course should begin with reading historical fiction to find your way to ground yourself in their world, in those characters' world, and then you can see the macro you know, gears shifting. Um, I mean, the list could go on forever. Uh, then I would say probably the most influential ever for me is not actually Dune, it's uh, Shadow and Claw by Gene Wolfe. Oh. Um, which is the writer's book. You know, it's a book where Neil Gaiman like bows at the altar of. Uh, it is so difficult to read, but so rewarding. I've never felt better tone. In fact, the main character's name is Severian, where Severo came from. Oh. And then Severo, it's also a joke because Servo in, in Latin means slave. So uh, Severo came from that book. And uh, a lot of Darrow was informed in terms of uh, the unreliable narrator from that book. Uh, so Shadow and Claw is a masterpiece. Okay, uh, any more questions? Hi, um, so kind of going back to the first book, I'm really curious as to, so in most stories, they go based off of like you find the love interest at, you know, later on, but starting off with Red Rising, you started off with Eo. Like, it appeared that he had that at the beginning, and that surprised me. What made you decide to Yeah, I wanted to, so I noticed a annoying trope in YA fiction uh, at the time of love triangles, and I thought, uh, let's kill that. Uh, <laughs> no, literally, no, I said, it is not interesting unless one of the points in the triangle is dead, because he then can't, he's not free to fall in love with Virginia, because it indicts his very character. Is he allowed to? because he's doing all these other things and morally he was so behind his wife and then he learns the greater context of her life and you know, she's not someone, he held her up on a pedestal because he didn't know any better and he was 16. And then she gets fuller, con he gets fuller context of her and realizes that she was flawed too and used him in a way and should have stayed alive but she was 16. You know, it's the Romeo and Juliet thing. They did stupid stuff because they were young and in love but she was in love with something more than him. And I wanted him to feel that emotional reaction of jealousy for her, the cause, and to feel almost lesser than the cause in Eo's eyes. Because all he wanted to be was very simple. He wanted to be loved, he wanted to be a father. And, he, and those things that he held up as the most important thing because his dad died for a cause, the woman he loved, it loved something more, more than him. And it made him feel small. And it made him have to look inward and uh, you know, almost come to terms with that before he could be free, free to fall in love with Virginia. And so what I wanted to do was create a love triangle with someone who was dead and which, in, which you know, the, the love, the future love, you know, really made him come to terms with um, the truth of it, you know. He had to accept Eo's sacrifice at her death. He had to accept that relationship. It wasn't just choosing between the wolf or the vampire. You know, <laughs> vampire, <laughs> obviously. All right, so we got time for one last question. You, sir. Golden Sun and Dark Age. It's a tie. Uh, parts of Dark Age I didn't love to write as much. Golden Sun was fun because it was just, you know, a rocket ship, and the world wasn't too complicated yet, and I was getting to explore exactly what I wanted to explore. Um, you know, and it's with that in mind that I'm trying to, you know, bring that more back into the series. Um, because when things get more complicated, they can get slower. But with myopia comes excitement, you know, with going through things in front of you. So trying to bring that back a bit and trying to remember that kind of romance of creating it. And that was, that was the most fun. Yeah, man. All right, so we are just about out of time, but uh, do I do one, have one, one, re one request. One more, we got a, we oh, got a oh, guy, he's been here, here he every go. con. Yeah. Hey, buddy. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you for being a huge fan. I've been a huge fan for a whole time. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I read it on a really dark place, and it just, like, it helped me with the stages stuff. It was just so good. And I also want to show you my background tattoo. Oh, yeah. Look at that beast. <laughs> Love it, man. Well, I wrote it when I was in a dark time myself, and uh, books have always been, you know, a way to find a compass for me. Uh, so I appreciate you saying that. All right. I have one last question, actually. Uh, uh, Pierce's publicist asked me to ask how many howlers there are in here. 
All right. <laughs> What's wrong with the other people? <laughs> But uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, this yeah, has been a spotlight guys. with Pierce Brown. Thank you. All right, have a great con.